Once upon a time. Welcome to Australian Book Lovers. Your destination for imagination. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here we are for, well, the first of our standalone Writer's Lounge for the Australian Book Lovers podcast, and this is a super cool opportunity for me because I have a very, very, very unique honour of talking to a guest who I already had the pleasure of interviewing, oh, quite a few episodes ago, but now have the super duper honour of sitting back in the Writer's Lounge and having a chill conversation, but all about things horror and pop culture and all those good things so without further ado first of all thank you mr phil hoare for joining us for the writer's lounge it is amazing to have a chat with you once again thank you for having me now we are in the virtual writer's lounge and of course based on the theme of what we're going to be talking today i am i haven't been to one but i have seen photos of of the ice bars um where you can everything is just frozen ice so i'm in one of those but uh as a tribute to what we're talking about, my ice bar has like little trinkets of blood captured within the ice crystals here and there just to add. And uh, with a little bit of lighting, it's a very uh, moody atmosphere. And uh, maybe I'm just sipping on, I don't know, I, I guess some good old fashioned straight vodka for this episode. What about yourself? Uh, of course, we're doing the thing. It's got to be JB Scotch. Ah, of course, now. Or whiskey, I, su- I should say. <laughs> yeah, and I suspect. Uh, the the original uh or well, the director of the what is considered to be the original thing movie uh, made a bit of a quip about uh, uh john carpenter's remake being perhaps just an advertisement for scotch but we'll get into that later but yes but we are talking about thing but we are talking also about your latest book release so for all of our listeners out there who i'm hoping are kicking back ready for this super big episode with a drink in hand how about uh letting us know what's happening with the book and and how it all came to be how did it come to be uh well the book is the thing the history of a franchise and because people don't realize just how much thing stuff there is out there and it kind of came about because it was the 40th anniversary and i was looking and you know i've got books on the planet of the apes franchise i've got books on lots of those things aliens i couldn't see anything about the thing and so Uh, I started talking to my publisher because I previously wrote a book about uh, the war on comic books in the 1950s. uh, Which I'll just quip in there. That is called, I believe, Horror. And uh, you can find a link to purchase on the website. Definitely check it out. Yes, definitely check it out. Yeah, so I was talking to to him and he went, well, it sounds great, but I think we're going to need some quotes. So if you can get some quotes, let's go for it. And I already had one. Because I know everyone, so or I, I at least I get to talk to a lot of people because of uh, all the different things I do, and I've been talking to Mike Plug, who is a '70s comic book artist. And if you watched the Marvel uh, Halloween special last year, uh, Werewolf by Night, he helped uh, create Werewolf by Night and lots of things from the '70s. Uh, there was a um, animated movie called Wizards. Oh yes, I know that. Oh, yeah, I, he did a lot of the designing of that. Yes, I actually saw a, a condensed version on 8mm of that in my friend's wow. uh, screening room not long ago. It's, it's an amazing movie. Mm. And the weird thing is the other person who does that is a big dinosaur artist, which you know I've been working dinosaurs for years. So, um, yeah, so I'd already, just by myself, I've always thought, if you know the movie, the 1982 John Carpenter, The Thing, the last shot of The Thing, before it blows up, the head looks like a tyrannosaur. Ah. And so I'd, I'd ask M- Mike Plu going, I've just got to ask you, is it a Tyrannosaur? Are you telling us that the thing has either been on the Earth for that long or has been to the Earth before and has somehow assimilated dinosaurs in the past and it has that dinosaur DNA in it? Because that, that just looked like a Tyrannosaur to me. And Mike Plu came back going, no, I wish <laughs> I'd thought of that. That's genius. <laughs> I really wish I'd thought of that. So I already had that one little snippet of a... a, a um, a, a quote so then i went hunting for others and well, very quickly got some and off we went well that could be a huge opportunity for a uh a, a, i guess uh 
you know, an alternate universe or, or a sequel or prequel, however you want to look at it. Because if it had visited the Earth before and did assimilate with the dinosaurs, then perhaps the, the meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs was actually an intentional <laughs> destruction to destroy the alien. I, I do actually have a, um, I've been working on a dinosaur book for a long time and that's kind of not far off the ending because ah. iridium's the the element that we find all over the world that really only comes in on asteroids and meteorites and the center of the earth which is the solid evidence that an asteroid hit the earth at 66 million years ago so i was kind of designing it that it was a iridium spaceship that may have come in and crashed in or something ah. i i did read in the uh, introduction to your book that you weren't actually introduced to a thing i mean I guess for everybody listening, of course, the book, The Thing, the John Carpenter movie, I, for most of us, myself included, when you when the someone mentions The Thing, that's the first thing, no pun intended, that comes to mind. That and, is. Uh, you know, and then it's from that that I learned about, you know, the, the, the 1950s movie and, of course, the short story. Um, and, yeah, I, c I can absolutely see a lot of the tentacles, again, no pun intended, of <laughs> where that story has, you know, uh, reached into pop culture. Um, but for yourself, it wasn't the 1982 movie that uh, brought you, was it? Or like, no, as it wasn't. In, got you there. No, no, it wasn't at all. Um, myself, I actually, I remember the old, uh, when you're at primary school and maybe in year seven at high school, you used to have the Scholastic Book Club. Oh, absolutely. That and the 12 records for a dollar. Yes. And so well, I, I, I remember, because uh, sci sci especially science fiction short stories weren't that available to kids back then. Um, I remember seeing in the Scholastic Book Club order catalog uh, this book called, I think it's Silver Streak. And I ordered that and it had this great spaceship on the cover and everything. And one of the first stories was the novella, Who Goes There? So my introduction is more through the actual story. And I didn't actually see the film until, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous saying it today, but back in the 80s, because videos were such a new thing, we used to have video birthday parties where you'd go to some kid's house and uh, you'd have a birthday party and eat some bad pizza and watch videos, you know, the latest video that we've rented. Oh, absolutely. And it was a slumber party. So there was about 15 boys, you know, 15, 14 year olds, <laughs> about 1 30 in the morning <laughs> putting let's put this one on holy crap that was a night to remember oh yeah especially yeah depending on your age because there is uh look i know there's a lot spoken especially back when it was originally released you know about the i guess in your face gore but as, as much as the gore plays a part um you know obviously it's not a feature of the movie but yes you're absolutely right when it does pop up it does grab you by total surprise and can really shake your foundations if you don't know it's coming especially the first time you're seeing it well and especially back then and it would have been too far off the release of the video so we weren't that far away from 1982 so it was probably 1983 that we saw it so what you know it would have been just as a new release on video so it wasn't that far off but there'd be nothing like that except maybe Alien. And Alien wasn't actually easy to see, you know. Uh, I, I, I don't recall anybody I knew having seen it in the cinema. And um, it had only been on TV once as like the late, late movie or something. So who'd seen a movie like this before? <laughs> well, but not only that, because I, 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 I too, I think, saw the thing or the late 1983 or early 84 on VHS, obviously. but looking back alien was available but the thing was that was definitely r-rated yep. and i think the m uh the uh sorry the thing wasn't r-rated uh so it was a little bit easier for us kids to get hold of it, or at least our parents let it slip through the, the goalie gates well that was um, the big one as well because parents knew that alien was a bad film for kids yeah that's right where the thing they didn't know what that was because it didn't do very well and not many people saw it so they're like okay that looks all right <laughs> the fools what was your impression i mean did you did it resonate with you as far as you know oh this is not not true to the story but a really good representation of the story when you're a kid or was it just like its whole whole own thing i gotta tell you i don't even recall associating them i really don't because the movie was so astonishing it, it was so impressive just by itself i was like a baby bird being imprinted on a on a new genre <laughs> like um, yeah, uh, I just remembered uh, who goes there because they're, they're not, yes, like they're the same character names and stuff in the book, uh, in the book as it is in the movie, but it, w it had been years since I'd read them. So I just wasn't associating that way. It wasn't until much later 
that I went, oh, it's based on who goes there. Hey, wait a minute, I remember reading that. When it, when it comes to the films itself, you know, what I think's really interested is that, you know, obviously Blade Runner came out in 82, um, and but you were, you were saying that, you know, the release of the thing on VHS wasn't too far after the cinema. And but so... What? When because they had to get their money. <laughs> yeah, well, they de definitely. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the reason I bring that up is like um, when, you know, now that we look back, you know, so Blade Runner was considered, you know, far from a success at the time and, and wasn't exactly embraced by critics of cinema. Uh, and neither was the thing. And they both sort of came out. And yes, everyone blames ET, uh, perhaps. Or, and I know that maybe in, this, in, in the instance of the thing, maybe Star Trek 2 played a, an influence as well. I was um, going to say, I blame Star Trek 2. I don't blame the, uh, E.T. I blame Star Trek 2, 100%. Well, but then when when they say that, uh, you know, when history is saying that it found its audience on VHS or when it when it got to home cinema, that was literally, you know, only six months a year after the cinema release. So was that a case that it was almost a, uh, I, I guess, you know, a bias from, from the mainstream press when it came to movie reviews for this particular you know, a couple of films because, uh, you know, I always find it odd that the thing was not embraced in the cinema and yet it became a hit. And, you know, it's everyone I know from even when I was a kid, you know, you talk about the thing, it's always been loved. So I've never spoken to anybody who didn't love it. So I'm not sure where did the non-love come from? So the non-love comes, we're, we're looking back, we're tra time traveling here. So you have to true, kind of work true. with the information you've got. But as far as I can see and what I've unearthed, is the first people who reviewed it the really harsh criticism that came of the film they never saw the film oh well, they, okay. they were sat down and they were given a one real cut of the film oh and it really it wasn't even the film it was all the extra footage that they just had lying around and one of the producers has kind of whacked this thing together and put it down with a with a voiceover ex introducing the characters and stuff like that and I only know this because uh, I discovered, uh, on, in fact, on YouTube, there's an interview of John Carpenter wearing one of the most horrible Cosby sweaters you'll ever see in your life. <laughs> and, and, what, think, and three cigarettes on the go. Yeah, yeah. well, he's on Letterman, so I don't think he's smoking, <laughs> oh, but okay. he looks like he wish he was. And, you know, when you watch uh, YouTube and you might watch a Letterman clip or, a, you know, one of those talk shows, and they'll go, and now we'll show you a clip, but they never have the clip. Oh, okay, yes. Because they don't have the rights to it, so they generally won't show you the clip. It'll just suddenly cut back and it's the audience reaction and them going, mm -hmm. well, that was interesting. They kept the clip in. Oh. Because it's so old, it's just a video. Somebody must have recorded it on their video and that person's put it up. So it's not an official clip. It's somebody's video VHS recording of them recording the, the interview one late night. And when you watch it, they show the clip. And I have never seen any of this footage. It's all second cuts and different angles and it's not the film. And that's when I started investigating it and I found a memo that was saying, this is what they're gonna see. They're gonna see like a 63 minute version of the film. And it's all been cut together by um, the, like, because they had to rush it out. Cause uh, basically they were told, they were gonna get a, a, like a say a December release date. And they were suddenly told, no, it's gonna be like August. So they lost months and they had to get it out and they had to get get it out screened for the uh cr critics so they just created this kind of truncated awful you know they're editing at the moment so we're just going to use this stuff that they're not using and so what they saw was not the film they did not see the film so whenever you hear any of these criticisms about oh there's no character development and it was so confusing and and it was just gore and harsh lights and they're not seeing the film they're seeing all this stuff that they were never meant to see so i think that's where partly that criticism comes from plus mm -hmm. obviously some people just didn't like the film when they did eventually see it but i think the reason why the vhs does so well and this seems to be across the board is it was pulled like it'd be put in for a couple of weeks in the cinema it's not making that much money because it's going to require word of mouth people are going to have to see it and come out like us and go oh my god that's the best movie ever and then go see it and their friends will come they didn't leave it in the cinemas long enough for that to happen because they're going look we're not selling much and we need the space to put et et's going gangbusters we're just going to fill up all these cinemas with et so let's just stop 
screening this film nobody's watching and let's put et in that screen and that way we'll triple our money yeah it's, a, it's such a well look to be honest i've never heard of um especially when it comes to you know mainstream movie reviewers to be doing that based on what, what is essentially b-roll off the floor yeah um, i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure they knew that's what they were seeing either though no well it, even it, that makes it even worse doesn't it and yeah the, the irony is look i know et has had such a huge pack on uh, sorry huge impact on pop culture and you know you can mention et to this day and everybody knows the movie yep. however for all those people that know about et how many people have seen it as opposed to you mentioned the thing everybody knows that and it's not a matter of whether they've seen it it's how many times have they seen yeah it. i was going to say you know and that's such a strange you know dichotomy isn't it from because what we think et is huge yeah but did it really have the legs does it really have the legs uh you know is it rewatchable i'm sure it is rewatchable but is it not now because they recut it oh of course yes they well, made the christian version oh didn't didn't steven spielberg uh go back and take back out though take out i'm not sure if he's done that since then but he released that and so but yeah, it took away my the guns point is, and stuff. a whole generation went and saw that as their et uh screening and that that's the one that didn't have any guns in it they replaced yeah. the guns with keys and 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 we and flashlights and stuff because i was a projectionist at the time and i remember that i was watching go what are we watching <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> uh but oh, just just before we go too far um, the reason why I think the VHS did very well, however, was there were some places where the thing wasn't pulled. It stayed in the cinema and it got the backing that we knew it would. People, word of mouth got out. Uh, places like Baltimore, uh, all these uh, towns where they're more secondary markets, it was left in there and it went really, really well and got fantastic reviews and a lot of word of mouth so when the vhs came out it was coming out on the back of that goodwill and good good reviews so i think that's why a lot of people were anticipating the video coming out because the, the by the time they're hearing all this the movie had gone in most places in most locations so they were waiting they were literally waiting for the vhs to come out and you can see if you go through you know it's fantastic to go through some of these old things because uh you know billboard magazine they had uh, you know the top 10 videos of the month and the top 10 cds of the month and things like that and you can see the thing once it was released just hit and stayed at number one for a very long time and after about a month you know more vhs came out but it was always in the top 10 top 20 for years um yeah so i think in the locations where the film stayed it actually did very well and word of mouth really got out there and, and they were having full sessions and stuff like that by the time it was finished screening and i think that's what helped with the vhs and that's why the vhs was infinitely more um popular than the movie and it makes me smile to think you know you mentioned that you know you saw it in one of these uh sort of birthday party or slum yeah. party you know uh, movie marathon nights where you know one of the rare times you get to sit down and watch movies to vhs was a special occasion um but just to think you know back then you know uh, of how many you know if you were sort of floating above how many families not for sure not families groups of people shall we say you know with the lights turned off sitting in the lounge on their little tiny square tvs just being on the edge of their seat by the thing all across the world you know thanks oh, to vhs is just I, a, I, amazing to think it, it would be like i can't imagine that not happening because it, as you said it was a very special and especially for like young enough to enjoy the film to really for that film to hit so you know young teenage boys basically that's how they'd be seeing it because it'd be a birthday because i don't know if you remember but i remember going to the video shop with my family and we weren't allowed to pick <laughs> yeah you, know, you could pick something up and show it to your parents and they might choose it but they're choosing <laughs> and they're well, saying yes or no to the videos yeah Whereas if it's your birthday your choice ah uh, yes this is true yeah but i remember my, our first video store you know mom and pop stores so to speak um you know i'd, I'd ride my bmx down there and of course i picked the horror films and uh you know that was the old days where the guy would get on the phone to my mum and go yeah he's picked this title and i, and I could tell what she's saying you know what's in it because yeah. he'd be like yeah it's not too bad you know there's oh, a little bit but he should be all right you know because it's r-rated and i was probably 11 
and uh he'd hang up the phone the old rotary phone and be like yeah okay and <laughs> off we go so yeah it was a pretty special occasion though going to a video store and and i think i had an even worse like a far worse than anybody else because we didn't have vhs we had beta oh <laughs> well so the, the amount of titles after a while that you could choose was very Wendell. limited <laughs> oh yes well in fact you got yeah your little special spot in the store got smaller yep. and smaller and yeah. watching it and, and we're like but it's the better system <laughs> yeah. yeah you can always spot that beta person because you could they were looking over their shoulder with envy while we were looking at all the titles in vhs I, I i got a job just to buy my own vhs machine and i had my own vhs machine so i remember like the glory of being unshackled yeah. i'm in the club i'm in the real world it was a weird time that vhs was such a big part of our life like it's almost impossible to explain now just how big of a like a a, a shift in the world to have media in your own home that you could choose and play at your own leisure and stop and and rewind it and play it again and watch it 50 times you know not only that but there's the intersection of you know you've got psychology art and you know the art of storytelling from stories in the sense of when you are walking in the store you know you could pick one video and there were shelves full and the artwork had to grab you and the artwork doesn't always represent what the movie was but there was that whole which i've just loved the, the vhs artwork which was designed to grab your attention designed to make you part with your money and and to take that risk and rent it and then like you said the word of mouth there was no internet or anything like that so the how fast word of mouth of a particular underground movie can spread is still amazing to this day that you could find out about titles that you know you, uh, are difficult enough to find on the internet and yet we found out about them you know through you know whispers and tin can conversations this seems to be true that the worse the film like the less money they spent making the film the more money they spent on the artwork of the vhs oh well that, the that, that's a mathematical the worst... formula the the thing had the worst cover ever like it had the thing on it and then a, like almost every vhs i've ever seen is a terrible photo of like one of the heads with a couple of teeth in it and it looks grainy and almost like a, a video of a video photo of the video um it wasn't a great cover what to you know and there were some fantastic VH vhs covers out there oh, uh fright absolutely. night stuff all these things that just oh but that was a good movie too though yeah right, but it, think it was of, but think they did spend the, a lot of money on it though yeah but think of the slayer with that uh the, the yeah. top, you know the, the 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 monster and the graphics of the 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 uh the font and it's amazing and then it's r-rated and you finally get the courage to find someone who can rent it for you and you take it and you watch it and it's equivalent of home and away with a murder somewhere in there well even worse was uh if you're a fantasy fan so all those uh you know science fantasy films in the in the 80s and they're all like boris boris covers or frank frazetta covers of these amazing paintings of barbarians holding swords and stuff oh yeah <laughs> you get it home it's you know some italian knockoff yeah it's filmed in the <laughs> car park yeah like oh it's just terrible what, what what a time to live <laughs> oh absolutely glorious but look what i'm really curious about is you know because obviously we're talking about your, your book when it comes to writing i guess you know capturing the whole effect of the thing you know its origins its repercussions its echoes its foundational shudders through pop culture and, and through literature and through film where i mean obviously you are very well versed in in research and and history etc but but where do you start to conquer a beast that is the thing like where do you sit down and go okay where do you start research is it just basic internet do you use some of your connections do you how do you even begin doing something like this all of the above all so, of the above yeah like i've been doing a lot of uh talks for in libraries and um writers festivals and things recently and the what like i'm getting to the point where I, i'm kind of telling people is don't ask for permission because you're never gonna get it i keep waiting for somebody to say what are you doing who are you to be doing this this isn't this shouldn't be you doing this you're a, you're a kid from canberra who didn't see the movie you know, like i keep waiting to be told no and there's nobody out there to tell me no <laughs> are you so, doing the equivalent of uh, just putting on a vest and charging on in yep just start just do it and so i that's what i decided it was the 40th anniversary and i'm smart enough to know 
this is a popular film and it's got a very avid reader base somebody's going to do something soon it's coming and i know i'm very good at my research i'm very quick and i can get in and i can spend hours and hours just pulling things apart so i just got to work and and the one thing i very quickly worked out is i didn't want to do the common stuff there's the thing is an amazing film as i said it's very avid lots of facebook pages for thing fans and they've unlike a lot of these facebook pages these are very active they've they've constantly got people not just posting but commenting and i don't know about you but there's a lot of facebook pages out there for stuff and a lot of people post stuff but there's no likes you know it might, might be seen by three people they're they're always commenting always always looking for something that nobody knew before um there's locations they go out there and they like in the, the 1982 film they blew up the helicopter and the guys found the location where they blew up the helicopter and they found pieces of pieces it. of it it's amazing and so i kind of realized there's also like even the dvd and the blu-ray there's been so many releases of the thing and there's some fantastic documentaries and commentaries and stuff like that so i kind of figured i that's what i didn't want to do i didn't want to write mm. the definitive background history of the thing using all those commentaries and because that's already out there and i knew they'd be re-releasing the film again and there'll probably be a lot more stuff being attached to that so what i decided to do is go for the stuff that people didn't know or rumors or just try and look into the background of stuff that isn't common knowledge and so it started with uh I, you know i i did go onto some of these fa these facebook pages and stuff and mentioned look this is what i'm going to do guys if anybody has any knowledge that isn't common you know, talk to me and the weird thing was one of the the, the uh, original author his great his grandson contacted me saying look i'm from the family and we'd wow. love to talk to you about this i had the family of the original author that is incredible yeah and that's and that's when i went yeah like full steam ahead here with, yeah that's yeah, a green I, light. I can't not let that go and then um if you know your 80s movies uh in the 80s almost every film got a novelization like yes. they all and not all of them were great <laughs> very and, few of them were great and a lot of those uh you know because obviously we're a book podcast a lot of those books a lot of the novelization should i say they came out before the movie but they were based on the script on the screenplay and so it was always um based on a motion picture or on you know the, the soon to be released motion picture which is always ironic i thought because they those authors got uh, given the screenplays the shooting scripts before we we sort of delve a little bit more into the thing and, and and the book and the research you know we are talking about something i love so dearly and that is a vhs and we were talking about you know how the times have changed from from going to a video store to now you know obviously we're on netflix and all that sort of stuff now um do you think that the you know a movie like the thing could still resonate in the same way as in even if it was done as a new production as opposed to the way it's it kind of slithered into our uh, you know social consciousness through VHS through those days when there wasn't too many options. I mean, and I mean that's a big philosophical question for a lot of movies. And but you know it's just ironic that uh, I, I guess I'll change the question. Sorry, Phil. Uh, I'm going to bring it back a little different way. I was. I may have an answer though. <laughs> oh, okay, excellent. Well, and and well, we'll make it a two part because here we are it's 2023 and uh myself and good friends we go to uh the cinema sessions of 80s horror movies so we've seen you know all of them and i'm also reanimator the shining and they're all sold out and we recently you know the irony was just as you were contacting us to let us know about the release of your new book um i had already had tickets to go and see the 40th anniversary of the thing on uh, what we call the emax here in adelaide which is you know this giant screen nice. and, and it was shoulder to shoulder booked out in fact the, the film was delayed because uh it took so long to get people in the cinema everyone's getting drinks and t-shirts and buying the uh the record uh you know soundtracks and stuff what is it that resonates is it is it a magic from the vhs time is it a or is it the story itself that resonates and there was a lot of new fans in the audience too that had never seen it so all of those questions we, we got a bit of a alien technology got in the way but uh yeah what, what are you what are your thoughts on that so i i may have two answers oh, i love two well, answers one of them being is um 
you kind of get to see how people are taking to the film today and i do mean like new audiences younger mm -hmm. audiences take it Absolutely. today yeah with all these review channels on youtube yes because yes. you now a lot of them are fake obviously they're they're saying oh i've never seen this i've never heard bohemian rhapsody before oh go away oh the uh, reaction videos yeah the reaction videos and stuff but a lot of the you know you can tell when you, when it's true like and it's not a common film unless you're kind of aware of it already so you know it's not always on a on a on a um netflix list or something like that you have to either know about it or somebody has to tell you about it or so i do believe a lot of these people have not seen the film before and just watching their reactions it's pretty obvious they haven't seen it before i've only seen one negative reaction they're all insanely positive and the one negative reaction is they didn't quite like the ending they they, they were so disappointed with the ending they were expecting some big finale fight ah yes the big and they boss didn't get level. it they got that yeah which is immediately showing that's what the reaction was happening in 1982 as well so some people loved it some people didn't so i think it is quality will always come out and this is why the 1982 thing is beloved and the 2011 prequel is almost universally hated because even though they tried very hard it was digital effects it's not practical effects and nobody uses practical effects anymore and the the staggering difference between practical effects and digital effects the gulf is so extreme that when they see a proper uh, practical effect film the quality of that really stands out especially compared to most horror and sci-fi films today so that's one part of why i think it would always it's always going to do well because even though technology's caught up to they can do almost anything today they don't and if they do they don't do it well because digital effects almost date the instant you see them how many digital effects films have you gone back and gone Ooh, that's not looking so good oh so look it it, it it honestly breaks my heart when i see movies where they even they're so lazy that a simple blood splattering is cgi yep. and it looks so pathetic and it's like you really you couldn't afford a couple of blood capsules or, and just or even spit worse, it out? the new thing i really despise is when they blood spatter the the camera lens even though it's digital oh. but that immediately takes me out of the film fourth wall because now yeah. you made me think well there's a camera there yeah exactly yeah <laughs> it's stupid <laughs> i just don't get that shot at all um so that's that that's one thing the other thing is uh that it is a film that is beloved and a lot of people talk about it and a lot of people tell their friends to watch it if they haven't seen it or you know these reaction channels they get paid to buy a sponsor to watch it for a dollar or something and it's one of the few films that will stand up to that scrutiny so many films you know like i used to get in a lot of trouble from a lot of friends because i'd tell them about a film oh, i've seen this film and i'd describe the film and then they'd watch it and it's nowhere near as good as my description because i'm a storyteller and I'll, I'll i'll tell it in a probably better way in, up in my a little description bit. yeah yeah so but the thing is such quality that you cannot oversell this film because it will stand up to anything you lay on it and it'll come out even better because there'll be stuff you didn't say or there'll be shots they weren't aware of and it's always it's got so many and it's not just jump scares and that's the, that's my biggest hate in horror today is just the you know you can see a jump scare coming from a mile away these days where the thing's not really about that it's about tension and yes. paranoia and it's it's showing you open doors and they're just characters talking with an open door behind you and you're just watching that door going oh something's about to come through that door <laughs> and it never does and but it's just all about paranoia and it's such a different film to any film that was made before it and any film that's made after it and it stands alone as this piece of quality that will never be replicated because it just nobody will replicate that no and, and i couldn't agree with you more but it's also you know from a i guess from an artistic side of things it's it's one of those films like like your empire strikes back or even the shining or for me something like jacob's ladder but it's one of those films where you could pause at any point and print it and it's going to be a magnificent piece of art on your wall but not only that you said quality will always shine through and i know you know it's been great seeing some of the 
the the horror films that I grew up with and, and experiencing that with new audiences. You know, there's a lot of people when we go to these sessions that, you know, of, of you know my age that have seen the movie a million times and know every line. But there's also this huge, you know, group of people, you know, uni students or people that have heard about it. And for example, seeing reanimated, there's lots of laughing and clapping and people screaming at the screen. Beautiful way to see it. And that's what that movie's made for. Yep. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you can feel the excitement when we went and saw the thing and, and uh, people were excited. They'd already had a few drinks and they were laughing and getting ready. But within five minutes, everybody was just glued to the screen. Uh, whether you'd seen it a million times or whether it was your first time and it just got everybody yet again and by the end of it instead of laughter and it was just nothing but applause um, because like you said that quality it just gets you and you're ready to go not only that seeing it on the big screen wow talk about you know seeing things that you just haven't seen for so long where you missed on vhs because when you you know anytime you see something on vhs or on, on tv or streaming or however you do it you've got distractions you look down your phone you go get a drink you turn to say something to your partner or your friend or whatever it might be you reach over to get the popcorn go to the cupboard to get the chips whatever it might be those could be pivotal scenes in the movie or for just beautiful little scenes cinema you're just locking your eyes onto that screen and when it's on a big massive screen like we saw it oh it's like seeing it for the first time there is just so much there to take in and and that's why i know because i wrote the damn book there is there's a few 70 mil prints out there somewhere they released a couple of 70 mil prints of the thing 1982 and to see that in 70 mil like lawrence oh, of arabia that scope. would be yeah that would just oh, be incredible my. but also what is on the edges of those that those film prints because that's a much bigger format um because i was a projectionist for a lot of years and you know uh you know i i also worked in video shops and music shops and stuff and people would come in and you'd be trying to sell them the widescreen video and be going i don't like that it cuts off the top and the bottom and you'd almost <laughs> yeah. want to punch them in the head um and i know like there's always edges to the film and so a 70 mil print is such a different format you know there's just millimeters you know that might be missing on a normal print that would look so much bigger on a 70 mil print um right. so i'm just curious i'd die to see a 70 and to be fair i haven't seen it in the big screen yet I, I was stuck in central Queensland, like around Rockhampton during the 40th anniversary. Oh, and no. I, I, I was contacting them. I was trying to get them to screen it. I was going, look, I'm writing the damn book <laughs> and <laughs> nobody would screen it here. Oh, no. I still I, haven't seen it on the big screen. Well, the, the first, you know, I realized that uh, it was going to be a whole new experience when, you know, the, the, the kind of the opening scene of the, the chopper chasing the, the little woofy. Um, you know, when I suddenly realized I had to literally crane my neck to the right, watching the helicopter and then realized, yep. you know, that take that's taking up 5% of the screen. And then, you know, to my whole left is still that huge Arctic landscape and all this stuff happening. And I was like, oh, this is going to be insane because uh, there's not one part of this, you know, there's so the screen's massive, but not only that, the way they filmed it there, like you said, there's just so much there on that widescreen format it's incredible but not only that it's the themes that come through isn't it and yeah. you know i'm sure that's something well I'd, I'd love for you to sort of open open the can of worms for that because your book is not just about the movie it's about you know how the story itself has resonated and inspired so much through pop culture what would you say a, a couple or or if not the main theme that's come through and and uh you know if you had to do a quick roller coaster ride through, what, how, or how has it touched all pop culture and inspired different stories, tales, and mediums? Well, it's been nearly a hundred years, so this is one of the world's major franchises. It's just not recognised as that. Um, anybody who knows horror knows the Universal Monsters. Mm -hmm. We love the Universal Monsters. I'm the biggest creature of the Black Lagoon. I've got action figures and mega figures of creature like i just love and plus it's fossils it's like the devonian age fossils i've even got the hand they've just released the hand the fossil hand that they discover at the beginning of the film mm -hmm. um oh i just i love the, the creature the thing is a universal monster 1982 john carpenter's is a universal film it's a universal monster 
and somebody on Facebook just released a thing about all the Universal Monsters and the thing's not there. And I had to jump in and go, as always, people forget the thing is a Universal Monster. And that's because it didn't start off as a Universal Monster. It started off at RKO in the films. But there's been comic books. There's been songs. In fact, in 1950, the biggest song in the world, number one in every radio station across the planet, in, in many places for six or seven weeks, which is, is astonishing for a song back then because so much music was coming out, was a song called The Thing. And it's it's part of the franchise. And I go through in the book why it's part of the franchise. It's kind of been ignored for a long time, but it's a very important point that happens. Um, so there's so much to this thing, this thing, and it's all about the unknown. I think the, the, the biggest part of this story is the unknown because it's all about not so much the creature itself. Uh, in fact, something I kind of say in the book, but I didn't go too much into was I tried to do the thing as a play. And I was con trying to find the family to contact them to get permission to do who goes there as a play. Oh, okay. Because to me in the 1982 film, it's not the creature. I love the creature and everything, but it's the, the scenes and the paranoia. Imagine sitting in a theater like an actual stage theater watching the the paranoia of these characters just falling apart and and the the the, the universal blankness of people in parkers you don't know who's who and i'd come up with all these things you know i was gonna have the thing actually in the audience and so an audience member would suddenly jump up halfway through the play and run off and be the creature Oh, that would be pretty awesome but then but, you but have to move it because people might come back and they're going you've got to watch this seat 3a oh, this is it yes so you'd have have a different seat and things like that so but but you're right it's it's a case of that as as much as the film now is is uh, famous for its you know uh, practical effects which are just phenomenal yep. um but it's really the, the interaction between the characters and it could easily be a, a play it could it, because it really is a, it, it, essentially the film is such a beautiful psychological study and I think one of the reasons it resonates is and it doesn't go overhanded it just assumes you just step into their world it doesn't build the world it doesn't you know have all this like beautifully you know emotionally swelling music to accentuate these themes that it's addressing it doesn't at all you're just throwing in with them but underlying all that is here are these people that each of them you in that environment you're relying on each other for pure survival and then you suddenly realize that you can't trust any of them because one of them could be your demise and that is such a really strong sort of thematic base to to, to look into psychology and like i said paranoia and and suddenly being forced to reevaluate trust and it would be such a a great um, you know theater you know performance do you think that's what's resonated through pop culture that that turning of the screw so to speak of going from survival together to not trusting you know to, to suddenly having to question the very friendships that were your lifeline at one point it is and that's i guess uh when you look at the other versions of the thing um because you know there was an x-files episode is the thing and there's a there's actually two very strong doctor who storylines because you can't say episode because they usually go for six or seven episodes uh, that are absolutely the thing and in fact when i looked into the background of that it became really fascinating um especially who wrote it now which uh, uh because uh now for listeners out there you can absolutely have a look at the the book trailer or the the, uh, the youtube video announcing the arrival of your book phil but sure. within within that montage of course is my favorite doctor who and that is tom baker yep. which which episode uh, i couldn't spot which you know i couldn't S quite spot seeds which of episode doom. Was. seeds uh. of doom it is the most undoctor like doctor who episode ever he is beyond violent he's he's killing people he's like there's fights and fist fights and it's action all the like that's not doctor who you know, he doesn't generally do that sort of stuff i i think it was actually a reasonably and doctor who's pretty scary like i still have <laughs> have, have dreams of little mannequins running around from the the talents of wang chiang but um 
I, I, I remember seeing it once, I see, and I actually write about the time I saw it, and I don't recall, you know, because Doctor Who was on repeat all the time. Absolutely. Channel 2, you had Famous 5, Goodies, yeah. and then Doctor Who. And I don't recall seeing it again. I think it got... Ah, I maybe think... it got some negative feedback, like, this is a bit too strong for kids. And maybe they just weren't showing it as often as the others. Because I remember seeing, you know, as I said, Talents of Wang Chang, I remember seeing that six or seven times. I only remember seeing this one once. And I think it's because it is an incredibly violent episode. He gets beaten up a lot. He, I think he throws a guy into a garbage compactor, oh. which is pretty horrific for Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah, but good on him, because obviously the dude deserved it. But yeah. Boy, but yeah. Um, so I just don't think it got played that much. Um, because I just don't rem I, I remember seeing it the once, and I do not do not remember seeing it ever uh, since then time. Um, but you can, you know, thanks to the marvels of the internet today, everything's somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure you can, you can find it somewhere to, well, to watch. Well, um, the goodies in Doctor Who are actually really tricky to find. Like yeah. you got to look at the Russian sites. <laughs> yeah, yes, of course. But then you got to go with the Russian dubbing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no. But uh, so, but as far as the longest running franchise, so so you got Doctor Who, and uh, you're talking about the X Files. Where else has it sort of reached into? There's literature or film, television. Yeah, where there's, else? there's been uh, you know lots of comics, you know, and of course Mad and all those uh, satire film. Uh, mm -hmm. None of them did a specific thing. Uh, John Cut, and this is where like it gets so confusing. So I, in the book, I do say. I stopped saying the thing because if you keep saying the thing, it's going to get really annoying real quick. So I call them like 51, 82, oh, okay. 11, just because you just can't keep saying the thing over and over and over again. Um, so 82, so there wasn't any like mad parody of the thing, 82, but there was a 51. Um, in fact, there was a series in one of these like 70s sci-fi comic magazines. They were comic-y sci-fi uh, magazines uh, like 1984 and, and stuff like that, uh, heavy metal. Uh, and there was a series called Rex Havoc and the Spud from Outer Space. Oh, I can't say I know that one. And if, if you jump on, I've actually got a, uh, the book has its own Facebook page and I'm releasing a lot of the images that I found because I just didn't have space in the book to do that. I was given a very strict word count and i've maxed out that word count i think i had three <laughs> words left so i just couldn't fit any uh images but i promised everyone as i was doing this stuff i will release it on the facebook page just jump on my facebook page like my facebook page and i will release chapter by chapter all the images that are found so you can see the, the the comic on my facebook page and it's really well drawn it's like amazingly drawn but it's clearly the 51 film but they're making it as a movie <laughs> Oh, okay. It, it was announced, I think, a year ago that they they are going to release that as a movie. This Rex Harrison, uh, Rex Havoc series. Um, so yeah, it wasn't just the comics. Uh, lots of bands, lots of music. Uh, the thing shows up in a lot of songs, especially uh, current heavy metal bands uh, have a lot of thing songs. Uh, there was a in the seventies. There was a a, a, a movie uh, that was absolutely based on the thing. The weirdest thing clone came out a couple of years ago uh i think it's the color of space ah yeah that was, was based hp lovecraft yeah but watch it and it's the thing because there is the llama the the, the llama thing in it and it is 100 percent the dog thing from the thing 1982 ah uh, that's a good point actually yeah and and 100 yep, percent. and the guy even admits it going nah, I, I just want to make my version of the thing so it just keeps showing up everywhere it, it's quite amazing you know and yeah lots of people are you know they're lots of fans and so they're they're trying to write their own versions of the thing or producing their own versions of the thing there's a uh, uh, my favorite is uh if you know the clay animation pingu the little penguin mm -hmm. you know uh, a guy did a thingu and it was on youtube for a long time and i found him and i interviewed him <laughs> because that's part of the law <laughs> thing oh wow and yeah what he had to say is quite amazing he got in a bit of a trouble uh so that's why if you you see it on youtube today it's called not <laughs> not pingu or not thingu because <laughs> he can't say it's part of the, they're very they're very litigious the pingu people yes um, well in hollywood in general to that extent 
Yeah, but but the one that really got me, and this happens a lot, you're just not aware of it, is how often because studios have all this footage that is beautiful footage filmed by the world's greatest cinematographers and 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 directors, and they film hours of stuff that they never use and that stuff's just sitting around and there's a lot of thing 1982 the john carpenter version that the actual footage from that film shows up in other films especially in the last 10 years there's all these horror films coming out and you watch them and you're going wait a minute i know that corridor and they've just got b-roll film from the john carpenter film and they're throwing it in their film isn't it amazing because when you think of something like alien or you think of something like the thing when it comes to like you said cinematography and uh you know second unit shots or or their establishing shots the aerial shots um all that sort of stuff there is such a timeless quality and what really comes down to i think cinematography a lot i mean i know you have you've worked in cinema you worked in video stores you, you worked i believe you know in in camber there with the australian film is it the film archives Ah, uh, yeah, the National Film and Sound Archives. That's, that's yeah. right, yeah. So you'd be in a good position to be able to comment on when you take someone like John Carpenter, who has has uh, given us so many fantastic movies, but at the same time, he can do something like The Thing, which every frame is timeless. And like I said, uh, you know, footage off the floor can be used in films today. And while it might be recognisable, it also fit in a modern cinema today. And yet some of these films look like they've been made for TV and they haven't aged at all you know they're shocking to a point of the lighting's horrible and it just looks like bad 80s television i don't know how you can go from one extreme to the other as a filmmaker but it must have something to do with cinematography well it yeah and as as we said earlier quality shines through so if you have the best film stock then you've got the best film stock and i believe um so we're, we're looking at you know 4k and all these uh you know they're now talking about 8k might be coming out soon uh, of all these new releases you know they just keep releasing the blu-ray and the you know the 4k and then the, i think the best quality 35 millimeter print comes in at something like 110k oh really the quality of that that like the quality of the actual image on that that frame on the film is something like 100k or something like that so we're not even getting close to the quality that can be put on film and that's why, and it's weird because we're changing formats of, digital formats are changing so quickly at the moment, it's causing a problem. Because even if you think, you know, when was the last time you got to play a quick time video? Oh, crikey. <laughs> and the second I say that, everybody goes, oh my God, yeah, quick time. But do you have something that will play it? And so if you filmed or you, you saved any media on quick time, you're already in trouble trying to play that quick time video so that these all these um uh movie studios are creating all these digital films what uh, the film will be complete digital there is no filming uh, there's no traditional celluloid filming of that movie whatsoever and once the film is completed they'll cut a a a a, a celluloid print they'll actually film uh, cut a film print in the canister to put aside because just, the amount just to of future proof it just to future proof it and the quality of that film will always be greater than anything you can save it as and so it, it's just a mind-boggling and uh it, it makes total sense when i really think about it and you know I've, when you told me about that originally that you know that that films are stored you know essentially when like when you're talking about you know 100 plus k on yeah. 35 millimeter print essentially we're talking about the master reel aren't we yes um, yeah and, and and so you know it won't be scratched it'll be a pristine print uh but it as you said it future proofs it like but going back to someone like john carpenter who didn't always have the money to film it in the best way and that's why some of his films you kind of watch and go what happened where'd the quality go and it's just because he didn't have the money for the quality they they didn't give him the best cameras and the best cinematographer and the best film stock he was doing with the next best or or somewhere down the line yeah he had the big w version of the uh, yeah. the lens yeah but if you film it with the best film and the best camera and the best lighting it's always going to be quality it's always going to look as bad as good as anything's ever going to look 
And that's why, you know, and again, we go back to why does the thing still resound today? It's filmed and it's filmed very well. And the practical effects are incredibly good and the acting's fantastic and the music's amazing. And there's nothing that takes you out of the film to date it. You don't, you do not watch the thing and go, ah, this is an 80s film. No, no at all. No. But how many films do you do that with? <laughs> you just go, oh my God, I'm watching a 90s film. I immediately know I'm watching a 90s film by, by you know, the, the quality of the, the film or, or... And the acting. I, I might be biased. Yeah. I, you know, I do a lot of work from home and I have a spare monitor to just, you know, have something go in the background. And of, of course, I'm a big VHS collector, so I might have digital stuff playing or I might be popping tapes in just for background. Yep. Uh, an 80s VHS? Like, yeah, there's some pretty, still some pretty shocking 80s VHS tapes out there. But when it got to the 90s, some style went out the window somehow. Yeah. <laughs> you could just tell, like I said, uh, absolutely. Well, people don't, people don't realise that a lot of 80s shows and things weren't video. They were filmed. Ah, yes. Lots yeah. of TV was actually filmed. Absolutely. And so it does stand up quite well, especially to 90s when they filmed nothing and it was all video. And you can watch video, you know, 90s shows today and they look horrible and they sound horrible even compared to 80s stuff because a lot of that stuff was actually filmed at the time. Not only that, I think uh, it's, it's debatable, of course. I mean, I grew up in the 90s as well, but there's just there's something uh, there's a creative element in the 70s and 80s. And I mean, we've still got that that 80s today i mean yeah they can try and rehash a few 90s movies i suppose but you know here we are 2023 and the tickets are selling for the 80s movies the remakes are the remakes of the 80s movies uh still coming out which is you know uh i was very happy to go see the new evil dead which is of course based on uh, well technically 79 but evil dead was really released in the 80s um and that again that's when you see the packed audiences and uh, everybody coming for that original 80s rush there's a lot of practical effects in the new evil dead but i digress you've obviously done some deep dives and of course for all the listeners out there that have seen the thing maybe seen it multiple times a lot of different theories for example the shadow uh before somebody one of the characters me said demise yep. uh you know the fact that mccready's light was on uh, but the big one is of course other characters drinking gasoline at the end now can you tell me where that theory you know in your research did you discover where that 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 theory or that myth originated and is there any truth to it is there any sort of is there any tentacles linking it back to the script the screenplay or the, the ideas for the film because i know there was a uh doing my quick little research i know that they, they did actually film a happy ending where mccready was rescued and had a blood test and he was all good and human and and that was the end of the film but i believe that was all pretty much chopped away and never got saw the light of day but there is that theory that um you know he hands Charles a bottle of gasoline and that's the giveaway that Charles drinks it without a wince where does that come from well they, they actually did about five endings some of them were just written but they they, they came up with about five endings because they just they I think they could see that the ending that they chose was fantastic but wasn't going to be popular especially with uh, studio so they kind of I think proof themselves by creating these other endings so that they could maybe even show them and go see it doesn't work you know having a happy ending doesn't work it, it, it's a we've got to go with this ending mm -hmm. as for the gasoline that's one of those ones that I didn't go there because I couldn't find anything I can find lots of people talking about it and I can see lots of rumors about it yeah that's right you watch yeah. it you can kind of go I don't know if I buy it. What? I don't yeah. buy it at all. Like I, 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 I can't see where this is coming from, because it doesn't make any sense. Because why would there be? Where would he get it from to begin with? And <laughs> like, it doesn't seem to make much sense. The other side, however, is the eyes. Ah, yes. And that's the one that does keep coming back in there. And and I actually mentioned in the book that I don't really trust. <laughs> the producers the people associated with the film that much anymore because you know i deep dived and i pulled out all of their interviews and they changed their story often a lot so for, just for our listener there can can you uh, describe the uh because I, I obviously know what it is the yeah the theory of the light in the eyes so the theory is that 
in the in the in the final scene you have two characters left they're kind of like where were you where were you i was here i was doing this um oh do you think one of us is the thing i think we're a bit too tired to to, to do anything about it and the theory is that one of the characters has no reflect like and that the whole camp's blown up there's fires all over the place and one of the characters has no light reflection in his eyes and the other one does and i have found john carpenter saying there's no reflection in the eyes he's the thing and then i've found john carpenter in interviews saying oh no that's the most ridiculous thing i did nothing like that whatsoever so i think it is one of them has no reflection in their eyes and going into other uh, versions so dark horse comics got the right to do the thing the comic and a guy wrote a thing comic series based on that ending and he basically has the two guys being uh rescued and trying to escape and they 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 get picked up by a submarine and i have found an interview with john carpenter going i love that comic series i love that storyline that would be the movie that is the sequel i would make so there's that version and just dark, uh, just dark horse uh have a penny on either side of the uh because if they both get rescued is, is that do they infer one, that they're both human them, or yeah no one of them is definitely not human right the other interesting one is i was talking about like novelizations before the novelizations of films and the thing novelization was written by alan dean foster and if you know anything about 80s films almost every novelization ever written during the 80s was written by alan dean foster um he just wrote everything and i found a website and it's one of the i don't know if you remember when the internet first started websites were just like a weird color and then the font would be like a a yellow font or a green font or they were just awful that's the the, the quality website i found for alan dean foster just a list of all his books and, and and biography and everything but the weird thing is there was an email on it and i went that cannot still be an active, <laughs> an active email so i emailed it and it is <laughs> oh no way and alan dean foster went are you the phil hoare who writes the prehistoric times magazine which i am <laughs> i'm like wait alan dean foster knows me <laughs> oh that's got to put a grin on your face yeah and that's happened about four times because dinosaur fans are just as avid as the thing and i've been writing the world's longest writing dinosaur magazine in the us for years so and i've got a pretty unusual name so <laughs> i think many things happen to make that happen but so we started chatting i'm like i'm I, I'm, I'm working on this book can i please interview you and he said yes so he's in the book like i've got to interview alan d foster wow did you but, when you interviewed oh, him did you stick to the thing or did you talk about his career i'm hoping you delved into uh, his career a little bit about a, it. a little bit um he he, he wasn't going to talk too much about that because mm -hmm. he's just released a book about ah. his career oh wow and so it's like i just really don't want to say too much because i want people to buy my book <laughs> i'm like oh that's perfectly understandable yeah absolutely yeah so yeah like so if you're out there and you love alan d foster buy his book there's actually a, a you can only get it on hardcover and there's a, a a specialist bookshop down in victoria who got a couple of copies in so you might have to google that one anyway the 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 family of the original author they've they've just released a new they, they found a new version of the the thing like the original novella they found he'd written a novel version oh you're kidding so it was released last year i think it was yeah i'm pretty sure it was just last year that the uh frozen hell was released and it's a novelized version from the original author expanded they also wrote a uh released a a anthology of short stories about the thing and they've got a sequel coming out i think in a month there's a what? sequel to the original storyline coming out right so this is amazing it's just incredible and when, you, when you say sequel coming out is that is that a release of the original author's work or is that i no no it's uh they've got an author who kind of the 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 novelization version wasn't fantastic like it needed a bit of work so they brought in a uh an author that they trust mm -hmm. and i think he's the also the publisher of the company they go through and he's 
fixed it up and everything. And then he he was the um, editor of the anthology, the short story anthology, and he's written the the sequel. But going back to the anthology, Alan Dean Foster has a short story in the anthology taking huh. up from the end of his novelization, What Happens to McCready. Oh, and, uh, wow. So his version of what he thinks happened is also there. And what he did, I... <laughs> is astonishing like, I oh mean, really that's the ballsiest thing i've seen in my life oh <laughs> no way people aren't burning your house down okay. and just by saying that i think you know where, where what, what what he said happened which one of them is the thing you know i'd, I'd heard the petrol or the gasoline theory for so long and but every time i watched it i, I just didn't find it then if, if anything no. i thought it was a um an exclamation point on the whole theme of trust because for me it's the, the way McCready sort of chuckles it's, yeah. it's almost as if oh see if we had just trusted each other all along we wouldn't be in this mess you know and it's kind of like oh now we're this is how we should have been sort of thing I don't know that's how I always read it but uh but yeah so where did oh, I mean how do we find the sequel the one that Foster wrote how do we get our hands on it it's just on their website, which I just don't have on me at the moment. Oh, I'll find it. I've got the book somewhere. I can't <laughs> remember the publication. But if you look, I think it's called Shorter Things. Okay. Because well, it's short stories. Well, I love the Frozen Hell. There's no beating around the bush there, is there, with that title? Yeah. And the cover was done by um, Bob Eggleton, who's a, he does all the Godzilla artwork in the world, like famous monsters covers and everything. He's just the, he's the Godzilla cover artist. Uh -huh. Um and you know lots of th uh, you know he's done so much other work um but yeah so it's it's you know they really threw a lot at it like um and i'm still amazed it's so little known and i'm not amazed because i didn't know i i kind of i only found out it when i started doing my research i'm like how am i not knowing this was out the other thing that i was really intrigued to read in uh you know in, in at least in synopsis of your book you talk about radio plays as well and that's something that i've been really enjoying lately you can find the old twilight zones and uh, you know the, yep. the old radio plays they're fantastic to listen to and i know they've done you know big audio productions of te technical canon sequels or, or sidelines for aliens you know with full actors yeah. and sound effects and stuff um it geez, it'd be a beautiful thing if they did the same thing for the thing well, there is one, a British, I don't want to say BBC because I don't think it is the BBC, but it's a full on British audio, uh, radio version of the thing. And you can find that that's, that's, you can find that on YouTube and stuff like that. Um, but there is a version where, um, Campbell, the original author, he, he, uh, used to, he was the editor of, um, Amazing Fantasy, the, uh, anthology magazine that was basically i think it turned into analog um but anyway uh so all these us radio when they started doing a lot of science fiction he came on and introduced all of these things and he introduced his own story who goes there and they did it and you can find all of them except for that one that one oh, has completely disappeared off the face of the planet and so if anybody out there <laughs> Those of this version, you'll make a lot of Think fans very happy. Yeah, if you somehow got a recording. Yeah, but the British one is there and it's great and it's also weird because you're listening to McCready and all these guys with British accents. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll take a bit of getting used to. Uh, but with all the deep I've done, with all the research, with all the interviews, and, and obviously a lot of time, I'm guessing late at night, where all you're doing is thinking about the thing um yep. with regards to the story the movie all of that what would you say is one or two of the most interesting things you discovered because i mean obviously there's there's all the trivia you know like we're just talking about the gasoline and you know there's deleted scenes and you know there's the uh you know the original story and all that sort of stuff but were there any kernels of trivia that you stumbled across that like made you sort of go whoa uh, something that you never would have anticipated you know bringing to the surface I found I discovered some things that are quite important that I was completely unaware of. And I think most people are unaware of like the, the finger of racism towards the film, which shocked me to my booties. I'm like, wait, racism. What? to so the 19 to 82. Yeah. And there are books <laughs> written about 
you know racism in science fiction and the thing is right like one of the big things that they point towards and i just gotta say rubbish <laughs> like i don't see it and i'm not trying to be so, like there's two african-american characters in the film both of them pretty much survive to the end of the film and one of them does survive it's it's one of those rare i mean we t everyone talks about mccready but realistically it's an ensemble cast isn't it and yeah. you know the movie itself although you could say mccready plays somewhat of a of a hero role when you re-watch it you, you it's pretty easy to see that it's it's all just character based where no one actually has that spotlight realistically in fact mccready is put under you know it becomes a suspect pretty early in the film once once the aliens sort of they don't and understand the concept so some the of the things mccready does if that was done by any other character they would have shot him some of the things he does like when they think he's it and they lock him out and he breaks in and grabs the dynamite and stuff if that was any of the other characters <laughs> yeah he would but, not have survived that episode true. whatsoever but, but there is a difference between a main character and an alpha character and he's obviously oh, no, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. but but yeah, I, absolutely. for the life of me i can't imagine how anyone can in any way it formulate goes back some sort to, of concept um, of racism yeah no it goes back to oh i've just forgotten his name the cook Knowles. Knowles. Knowles that's, that's the one yeah um so that was going to be a different actor a more famous african-american actor who went that's the single most racist role i've ever seen and i refuse to do it oh and then when the actor who d does play Knowles took the role he kind of got attacked by the african-american community a little bit for taking that role and it looks like uh the author of the script sat, well no, it doesn't look like he did he admits it he went oh my god racism i wasn't aware and he sits down with that actor and they rewrote his part because of the supposed you know um it was a little bit too racist or it was just a bit too of a caricature might be a better way of putting it mm, or maybe almost so you could say cliche apparently without. they may change that one a little bit but there was also um an incident when they were filming because they were filming up in alaska and not a lot of african-americans up in alaska and that actor uh almost got beaten to death apparently in a bar fight oh wow a bunch of white redneck uh miners and oil guys and stuff like that and oh, so dear. that well, was one of the interesting of the things movie, i was though, discovering yeah no no uh well it was in the fact that a lot of a lot of people are still writing about the movie as a racist film that it is still racist and that's why i was saying but you know i'm not trying to be a dick i'm literally going i can't see it both african-american actors survive to the end and they're not and one of them's the major powerful character you know and he's got some of the best lines of the film that we still remember like you know i ain't gonna believe none of this voodoo bullshit either like i don't see it when it comes to different actors or or trivia like there's some you know if we can we'll quickly go through a little bit of it because it's quite fascinating especially for people that love the movie i mean i didn't realize that um you know originally the script was written with the idea of clint eastwood or harrison ford now i could kind of see clint and eastwood. an australian yes that's where i was going to get to yes uh now none other than jack thompson as crazy as that sounds i could see that working and he was big at the time and he he was and if you look at what he's done since then he's been in a lot of american movies um i well, think I could, I could definitely see him pouring a you know glass of scotch on a computer with a little bit of a smell yeah and you know that australian swagger so yeah absolutely now i have talked to one of the producers who went no that's not the case that you know he was never offered the role oh okay but uh, again i'm reading stuff and then reading other sides of stuff and they're reversing their opinions and <laughs> you have to look at or i had to look at a lot of what was being said at the time through the lens of why it was being said at the time so they're talking about the film before its release and they're mm -hmm. also positive oh we're so happy this is the best stuff we've ever seen you will not believe what you're going to see and then there's a lot of interviews in the direct basically the the backwash from the bad reviews and now they're trying to cover themselves in a way or try to explain themselves in a way mm -hmm. and so 
they're talking they're being interviewed at a different kind of angle and they're trying to put a different spin on what's happening and then you know then you get the reviewing of history because now it's 20 years later and it's beloved and now people are feeling a bit better about themselves and trying to take responsibility for things that they may well have done or taking responsibility for things that wasn't really them but nobody's around to say they didn't do it anymore so it is quite weird when you do this sort of work that you you do have to keep in mind why was that person why is their story changed and there could be a reason for that and which yeah, one's the truth <laughs> it'd be a matter of unpacking yeah because a lot of them would have told a fib and then stuck to that fib and now they're gonna have to explain why that fib wasn't a fib and then but the fib was told over another fib that was used for yes. purposes and, and, and if, if you tell a lie long enough you start to believe that oh, lie. Yeah, absolutely. and i'm not and, uh, and i'm not trying to th throw anything at anybody i'm not saying you know they've done something wrong i'm not disparaging anyone i'm just saying time is a fickle thing and we're talking 40 years and so you forget oh, <laughs> or yeah. you think you remember or you may have heard somebody else say something you're like oh my god that's right that was it you know like things like that happen all the time so you, you have to be a bit fair about it but that's why i kind of say look we're going to go through a lot of this stuff and this is what i think this is my own personal opinion of what's happened because even how john carpenter got on the film he's he said two or three different versions the producer said two or three different versions um that that one one re, real film the preview you know the producers come out and said no that didn't happen i'm like oh yeah it did i'm 100 percent positive it did i just think you weren't the because there's more than one producer you're not the guy who did it because that absolutely happened you can watch it <laughs> it's, it's it exists it's a real thing but you said, um, you know, it was interesting how John Carpenter came on. And because I was reading that the, you know, when it was originally sort of getting tossed around, it was actually before he'd even made Halloween and he wasn't attached to the thing, but Toe Hooper was based on the success oh. of Texas Chainsaw, of course. But he wanted yep. to do apparently, you know, a completely different spin. And so it sort of never got off the ground that way. Basically wanted to do a Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be a Marine basically weird some weird whale kind of thing with captain ahab trying to kill it um no Which there was actually been quite a, that bad but obviously it wouldn't have no, been the thing yeah there was a couple other versions as well um and a couple other directors put to it and things that takes me back to the 51 film the one thing so you're asking you know what are some of the things that if there's anything i you know that i can kind of point my finger back going that i was surprised at that and one is almost everyone says that um howard hawks this famous director did not direct the 51 film that it was this other guy who directed it and there's volumes <laughs> out there saying howard hawks was the producer he was on set to help out but it was this other nebi guy uh, that did it and without a doubt i believe i prove that's rubbish howard hawks directed it without a doubt oh okay yeah i i think like i think i proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt that howard hawks directed that film and you know the, the the other director went to his deathbed literally saying i'm sick of you people always saying i didn't direct it and he went on to direct other things other you know a lot of tv a lot of other b-grade films and one of the things i point to is none of them of quality like none of them show the the the, the amazing you know cinematography and angles and everything that you get in the 51 film it's mm. clearly a howard hawks film like there's just no and i've found photos of howard hawks on the set <laughs> you know, directing the damn thing and the big one is i've managed to find the main actor from the 51 film standing there, like in i found very rare interviews with him and him going oh no it was hawks hawks directed it the other guy was there and he did a, a bunch of the stuff but it was absolutely howard hawks directing it the whole way through so like sorry tales over <laughs> howard hawks directed the 91 the 1951 the thing but isn't that interesting because we're talking about how there was a a moment in time where you know there was the possibility that it might have been to Pooper, and of course he found himself in the same predicament with poltergeist where you know yes. a, a film directed by Toe Pooper, but and yet 
you know, movie lore has basically written in stone that no, not at all. Steven Spielberg directed Poltergeist. Um, and of course, and, and there's yet, nothing but, definitive out there. And yes, you can see it, it. Well, depending on how you look at the film, you can you can say yes or no. It depends on what you look for. Yes, except what I would say is uh, Hoop has the the runs on the board. <laughs> we can see he's no, he's an actual director. He's directed a lot of stuff. And this other guy had never directed anything and really didn't direct anything after that except for a couple of TV episodes and stuff. Mm. If he's this high quality of director, made the first, and that's what people forget, uh, the 1951 film was the first science fiction film after the war. A society, a world that is so weary of, you know, the war movies that were coming out in the 40s and the, the crime stories because everything was so grim and dark. And this was the first, basically, we're cutting ties with the war. We're looking to the future. We're going to bring fun back into the, your world. Like, the hype around that 1951 film is phenomenal. And you can see it in every journal. Like, they spent millions promoting that 51 film. Wow. Um, yeah, because which, it was which is the first. Then. Yeah. And it was the first, the first film. And it was being directed by one of the greatest directors ever <laughs> um you know his girl friday he every every genre of film that you can imagine in the 40s the number one film of that genre was done by howard hawks uh he directed you know the big sleep he did like oh my god he did everything so this was like the steven spielberg of the time making a film you can imagine if there hadn't been say say star wars came out with George Lucas and then they never made another Star Wars film at all and then 20 years later or 10 years later it was announced George Lucas was going to release the sequel to Star Wars can you imagine the hype around that film oh yeah it was massive and that that's why like uh uh there is a song called The Thing that I talked about before that's why I put it in the franchise because it's clearly affecting each other but yeah it was just phenomenal what was happening with this movie and Howard Hawks, however, was, you can clearly see he was a bit concerned that, yeah, okay, uh, it is a science fiction film and I'm used to making these, you know, monumental films. So maybe I won't put my name on it <laughs> mm. just in case it doesn't do so well. Because he was getting a lot of flack. A lot of, a lot of newspapers, a lot of magazines were going, why is Howard Hawks making such rubbish? Because science fiction was considered a degrade genre. And their problem that that was pre Alan Smithy days, wasn't it? Yeah, and for people who don't know who Alan Smithy is, you know, uh, watch uh, is it American his, American History X? <laughs> wasn't that the last Alan Smithy film? Oh, you, I think it could be right. Yeah, but but yes, for for directors that for movie directors that uh, for whatever reason want to disown the finished product, and a lot of times it's because of the way the producers have come in and re-edited, or even sometimes you know gone over the line and hire someone to reshoot certain scenes they asked to have their name taken off so that but it has to have a name on there so directed by alan smithy the difference thing though is there there is a i think there's a reason to keep re-watching it because yeah it's, there's always something new to see or you can go in with a different uh a, a objective you might want to look at um you know background see if there's any hints there as to who's the thing or who isn't uh, like i said uh, you discover about the light in the eyes because i believe that the theories that that also applies to the, uh, the the blood scene where they're testing each other's blood with the in the dish with a little bit of a heat treatment which yeah. i think you know we we probably shouldn't go down because it's going to be the cliche of cliches and yet you know back in 1982 who would have seen it but that whole idea that that tension in the room with the uh, with the end of the soldering iron ready to touch the blood and who's infected and who's not you know talk about a symbol of of the COVID pandemic and yep. that division in society i mean i'm sure that the, the thing is inspired books written about that just that very scene and how that scene represents perhaps one of the greatest divisions that have been placed upon society based well, on our blood i'll take that one one step further because what we go into the book is what was happening in the world at the time which wasn't covid and especially when it comes to blood mm -hmm. it was aids i was gonna say the grim reaper with the bowling ball yep and that's that again 
I was surprised at how much some people have gone into the AIDS side of the thing. There's, there's, there's whole books written about the paranoia of AIDS and, and the, uh, the gay plague and all that stuff. And the thing shows up all the time because people are looking for a reason why it failed. And one of the suggestions is a movie that is so much about blood at the exact month that AIDS is announced worldwide or, you know, breaks into the media for the first time ever about this new epidemic. So there's a lot of suggestions. It was people going to this film, seeing that and going, oh my God, and already paranoid beyond belief that you can get this horrible disease through blood. And again, not really seeing it. <laughs> no, I, I think, look, sometimes it's even just the simpler it, things, isn't it? You know, if a cinema, if you're going up against a movie that, um, if, 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 a, if person A is going to go see movie A, but movie A allows that person A to bring any people they want, well, then let's say you have an average of four people going in at a time because you can have kids. Whereas the thing, you can't bring your family. It's not a kid film, so you might be a single right. ticket versus a, a family ticket. And but also the timing doesn't quite work because, yes, they're absolutely like absolutely true. The first, I think it was the New York Times, wrote an article about this new disease being showing up amongst the gay population. Is timing-wise works. Who's reading the New York Times? <laughs> Somebody in Australia is not reading the New York Times. No, not at all. So no. it doesn't quite work worldwide. Like, no. If it was a year later when the paranoia really starts to amp up, okay, I, I can see that. But that paranoia wouldn't be the, the association between both. I cannot see that being there because I cannot people going in and going, oh my God, it's just like AIDS. Like, <laughs> no. who would do that? Like, no. it, it wasn't that big a thing at the time. It was just something that was just starting to be talked about. It wasn't the the paranoia that you need to really destroy a film's credibility or or um, profitability, it, like there just hasn't been enough time for that. So I, I, I don't see it. But what I will say is that, and I said it earlier, is Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan is the film I blame for the thing failing. And it goes back to everything we've been talking about, that it's word of mouth, it's horror fans and science fiction fans who know the 1951 film supporting this film and they didn't and that's because if you go to all of the magazines at the time like star log all these horror magazines and science fiction magazines and everything the thing barely gets a mention like they it's there's a couple of articles that's it but almost every second article in those magazines for nearly a year and a half, Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan. The, the geek squad <laughs> was getting their start. <laughs> they, they were disappointed with Star Trek, the emotion picture, and everything was coming out that Wrath of Khan was bringing back the Ricardo Multiban character, and it's going to be the action-y film that the first one should have been. This is going to be your film. And they were getting so excited for this film and all the articles and all the magazines and everything was all about Star Trek and the thing just wasn't getting a look in. So that's the film. I'm not saying like it was done any like anything malicious or anything. I just think that was the film it, everybody wanted to see. You know, the world wanted to see E.T. Pop culture, <laughs> especially science fiction, wanted to see Wrath of Khan. Well, I don't know. I, I haven't had the uh, opportunity to read your book here. I don't know if you touched on it, but and without being, you know, I, look, I hate to find myself saying, you know, back in the day, um, yeah. but, but, you know, look, I love, you know, I'm, I still go to the cinema every week here. So, you know, I haven't stopped going to the cinema and I embrace all of it. You know, I love, I love streaming and everything like that. But from even from an object, objective, should I say, standpoint, you know, having the luxury of growing up, you know, in the eighties, even the late seventies, um, I was a little tacker, of course, but the eighties, it's hard to describe or at least, you know, um, have somebody visualize or the emotions, the whole concept that, you know, in the eighties, a film would be, um, I guess it would 
blanket a summer for example like it would be the summer yep. of a movie and it wasn't that a movie came you watched it and that was the end of it it was the anticipation and then when it arrived it's the t-shirts it's the mugs it's everyone talking about it you're getting the bubblegum cards you know the, the lunch boxes you know it's, it's just it doesn't go away you know when gremlins come it's all about gremlins for three months four months uh temple of doom that's a whole summer where all you do is talk about indiana jones and and all this sort of stuff it makes it so hard for a movie to break through when you know the other thing to, to, to sort of tie this all in is um when you talk about quality so um we are going live as far as we're recording so audience the lovely listeners here's a bit of a clicky clack but i'm going to put in just a quick little search um movie releases because you talk about wrath of khan or star wars um let's look at some of the stuff we got in 82 we had the thing rocky 3 poltergeist beastmaster friday 13th part 3 uh first blood tron i mean the 80s how do you 48 hours how do you um shine when when the whole year is just you know, uh, groundbreaking pop culture films that resonate to today. That's, that's the other thing I think the thing had going against it. it you know, the, the, there's a lot of decades, well, a lot of decades, a lot of years in the 80s where still to this day were shaped by the films that came out. And it wasn't just one that came out that year, there was 20 amazing movies. And, that, and that's it, you get lost in the crowd. And yeah. don't forget on top of all that, you did have E.T. So. I don't know about you guys, but in Canberra, we had one TV station, like commercial station. We had ABC, which doesn't allow commercials, and we had Channel 10 or Capital, it was called. That's it. And so there's very limited space for advertising and the radio stations. We probably had one or two radio stations. We didn't have the big multi whatever radio stations. So you got the newspaper and we had one newspaper and you might've got the TV week. Oh, so course. where are you seeing the ad to go see the thing? You're not seeing the trailer on YouTube. You're not seeing it on TV. You're not. Where, how are you exposed to this film in any way, shape or form unless you know to, where to look for it? Because you're not seeing the trailers. You're not seeing it, the ads because the ads aren't on. Uh, because E.T. is dominating everything. You know, the pizza hut's doing the ET glass with your pizza or like, it's just the big, the, 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 the phenomenas that there's a reason why they're that big and they are dominating so much of them, the marketing and media at the time. So especially when you're in Australia, <laughs> like this is in America. So I don't recall seeing anything about the thing until I went to a video party and the guy pulled out a videotape and went, we're watching this. I'm like, all right, I don't know what it is. And, and that's why I was going back to word of mouth is so important because you used to have that kid at school who'd come to school and go, oh, I just saw this movie about a, a guy, a cop who gets shot and, and his body's completely ruined. So they turn him into a robot and, and he starts fighting crime and it's really funny and action-y and, and I think it's called Robocop. And then you're like, oh, my friend said, you know, can we go see Robocop? That's how a lot of kids found out about certain films. And if nobody's talking about that film, then who knows about it? Exactly. And the, I think I learned so much from the playground when looking back in the sense of, you know, I loved books back then, or still do, of course, and I love movies, so I still do. But, you know, to be, to have your imagination excited about a book or a, or a movie, you know, like you said, there's always that one kid or you, you have to rely on someone who for through whatever serendipity they discovered it. And whether it's a you know, hardcore naughty book, horror book or whatever it is in my case, or a horror movie, you're literally getting my attention. They're describing it in one sentence. And like you said, a uh, cock gets shot and rebuilt into a robot. Bam, there's your there's your synopsis as opposed yep. to a whole intricate thing but that's how it had to be you had what? one sentence you know in the schoolyard and that could be enough to send well, you I was on a big, search i was a big comic collector at the time yeah you know, and you know at the time i was a comic collector i didn't have that you know didn't have the money to buy that many comics but if you've still got your list up about what films came out in 1982 and if you're looking at the 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 biggest profits look at i the next five films under the thing and there's a film sitting there i bet you and i'm not looking at it myself but i just know it's sitting there 
Do you have that list up or? Oh, actually, what I've got is by popularity. So we've got, um, and for everybody out there, I mean, look, some of these, just think, just this was just a basic summer in 1982. Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Blade Runner, The Thing, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Poltergeist, Conan the Barbarian, First Blood, Annie, uh, King of Comedy, which I love, Friday the 13th Part 3, 48 Hours, Tron, Halloween 3, Sins of the Witch, Star Trek 2, Wrath of Khan, Cat People, An Officer and a Gentleman, uh, Evil on the Side, Creep Show. Um, of course, is that what you're talking about with the comics? Yeah. No, no, if you look under the, th like, if you go down to the bottom of that list, if it's going by popularity, there's going to be an action science fiction movie there. Okay, well, let's keep going. We've got Rocky, Rocky 3, Slumber Party Mas Massacre, The Dark Crystal, which I've got here on VHS behind me. We've got Zapped, which I've got VHS behind me. Pink Floyd, The Wall, Secret Nin, The Beastmaster, The Entity, which I've got on the wall in VHS behind me. We've got Swamp Thing, Forbidden World, Tenebrae uh night shift which i've got on vhs class of 1984 pieces which i want to get on vhs the sword and the sorcerer basket case uh the world according to garp losing it uh best little whorehouse and that's why Texas. popularity it's going to be near the end oh so. let's have a look uh one to 50. Oh, that's all they've given me 150. so i'm gonna have to uh rely on you to reveal what you think's on the bottom because oh, uh, uh, that's not fair I, I, I was hoping you'd read it out because i'm st struggling to remember the, the 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 name of it it's a team of like a basically a un team with uh flying motorbikes and um i, I can't get past the thought of saying delta force and it's not delta force but every marvel comic that was the back page of every comic for nearly a year i think it made two million dollars <laughs> like it made no money <laughs> but to me that's what i was being marketed was this film and i think the main character was uh if you ever watched um there's a michael j fox film where he's in politics a tv show he was in politics and the mayor was the the main character anyway anyway wh whatever that film is um that's the comic like in the comic books that was the ad on every single comic book they thought it was going to it's going to be a franchise they were going to make hundreds of them it was going to make all the money in the world and it's the oh it's just awful this film is just terrible like it's cheesy fun today but it was just an awful film but my point is that's the movie i knew was coming because that's the only movie i saw in every comic book that i was reading they spent the advertising budget on the back cover of every comic book in marvel you know and i can still see the the, the cover of it today so where was i learning about the thing <laughs> mm, but that it doesn't that really highlight you know sort of being aware of how difficult it was to know about upcoming releases especially when it comes to the yep. cinema and being in that bubble that we all were here in australia and for everybody because it, there wasn't you know netflix or internet or anything like that yes there was the newspaper and yes there was uh you know the, uh, i don't know i can't remember when fangoria started but you know you had just you you mad magazine stuff like that but saying all that isn't that why there was such a absolutely dazzling magic about walking into the video store when they first i was going to say because then there's all the covers jumping out at you, films that you'd never heard of, or maybe heard whispers of, and oh lordy, not, paradise. Not, not just that. The second I say it, you'll go, oh my god, you're right. You'd go into the video shop, and there'd be a TV playing above this, the 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 counter mm -hmm. where they've got a videotape of trailers. Yes. On just going, th just playing non-stop. So you'd be cruising and you'd be watching this TV screen, and going, what the hell's that film? because you'd just see back-to-back -back trailers of all the you know they'd get that month's trailer video and that's what they'd throw in and be playing and so and also every video shop it unlike a cinema a cinema is a a, a corporation the video shop is curated so if you've got a guy behind the counter who liked that film guess what film he's promoting and telling you to watch and got in pride of place and and gets happy when you you rent it and you come back saying oh, i love this film so video shops were a curated experience where often you had somebody there going you, you know you'd go up to them and go oh i'm looking for a movie like this and they go oh mate watch this one so that's how a lot of people found the thing because as you said you'd walk in and you'd see the covers or you might have seen the trailer playing above or it's in the top 10 this week 
and it's in the the top 10 new releases or the top 10 releases or there's it's more likely that a friend of yours has rented the video than seen it in the cinema that's so right. they're coming to school going i saw this video on the weekend <laughs> well i was gonna say i hate i know this is gonna be a cliche and i hope i don't well i'm I've got a bad habit of stepping in a cringe, but I think, you know, you could almost put it on a t-shirt, you know, so has, you know, someone saying, oh, I've seen, I just saw this film of you, sir. No. Oh, mate, you got to watch it. And I think yep. that's, that was the, that's what it was. Mate, you got to watch it. Um, and that's how you found out about movies. And of course, and, the artwork, and, uh, uh, the crap shirt. Yeah. And that Robocop story is how I found Robocop. I had a friend come in and go, oh my God, I just saw this film. I'm like, what? What's this film? <laughs> So well, it, yeah, it like I was really like, did still, work. The yeah, I still remember would have been 1982 because it was I was still at the, a particular prom school when someone I don't know how that kid had seen First Blood, but he was telling me the story about it, and it didn't tweak in my memory until a couple of years later when I did see First Blood, and I didn't see it until I was a, a bit older. Um, oh, yeah. th then then the, the memory came back and I went, wow, that kid, you know, when I was in year four in 1982. He did see first flight because he would. He was telling me a couple of scenes, and you know, it meant nothing to me at the time. And the uh, razor blade on the stomach. That was no, always the one I remember yeah, he, telling me about. Yeah, but he was. Uh, I think the the knife at the throat. You know, when he gets oh, yeah, yeah. against and, and stuff like that. But uh, of course, then when I look back, and it's like, oh wow, he really did see it. You know, but that was that, like you said, it was like these mythical films. These and and we became storytellers of stories in the playground. <laughs> We, we also had parents who parented so i had lots of younger brothers and sisters and i remember my dad coming home um and they had a tv and a video in their bedroom and he went come with me and i'm like oh my god i'm in trouble <laughs> and we went into their bedroom and he went look i think you're old enough so um i've got this movie that i love and i think you'll enjoy so you, you the others they're too young to watch this Ooh, but you he, can watch this oh you would have felt pretty damn powerful oh hell yeah and he put on wild geese oh which okay is a, the war uh, movie uh, yeah war movie where there's lots of like machetes chopping people up and lots of blood and things like that and it's a it's such a tame film if you see it today yeah absolutely but at the time i was like oh my god they make movies like this and so there's also that aspect of it is like you know you weren't allowed to see certain things or you 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 know you try and pick up something and your mother would go no you're not having that um i i, I went to a catholic high school and in year seven um we had our pastoral group which is just your group you're in before you go to class they they were going to go do something and there was a play a, a theater show coming in so we were going to see the rocky horror show and out my my year seven <laughs> catholic pastoral group was going to the rocky horror show and the night before my parents were watching the news like oh this is coming to town today in canberra and they saw the clip of it they went that's what they're going to go see <laughs> <laughs> you're not going and i was allowed to go oh damn but that's um i think that's really if, if you had to draw a big thick red line with a texture between you know entertainment today and entertainment back then the, uh, today there is what is missing i mean there are many positives so i'm not saying that it was better or worse but one thing that differentiates i think the experience for for somebody who loves cinema and literature and that is today the quest aspect is gone there's no quest there's no how do i find this how do i see this how do i do you know what i mean today if you want it you get it you know yes if it's, if it's not on this channel it's on the streaming as, channel as otherwise said, you download it or you buy it from you jump on amazon and you jump on ebay back then you hear about it at the schoolyard it became a quest you can't yep. just walk at 11 years old and go find it it's it it's a you know it's this mountain that you have to climb and there's but, a holy but, grail when you finally see it even the video shop like they might only have one copy of that film <laughs> if it's a popular film it's never on the shelf. <laughs> no. Somebody's always renting the bloody thing. It's gone, hide out. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what I mean. The quest comes with many layers. And <laughs> just when you think I, you've got there. I, I was just going to say, I'll expand on that. There's too much today. So there's too much media. There, there's things coming out that five years ago, I would have killed to see. I would have been so excited to see. And there's so much on my to watch list at the moment that I'm like, oh, I can't even get to it. Like, I, yeah, I'll, I'll watch it at some point. They're being inundated with 
quality, but also quantity. And that wasn't the case back then. You know, like there was one really good horror alien film and there was one re- like you watched like the king of our school the king of my year was a kid who for his birthday was given the videotape for the terminator we watched that film almost every day over and over yeah, <laughs> over, over again like i could still say you know uzi nine millimeter hey you know your guns uh, uzi, uh, you know, 45 auto slide with laser sighting um like I know every single aspect of that film because we, that was our film and we watched it and we watched it and we, because we didn't have anything else to watch. No, no, you just watch <laughs> it over or, again. Yeah. Or well, you watch it until the goodies comes on at 5.30 or something. Like, so they've got so much stuff today that they never get to, to learn. And, and to take it a step further, that's why old films are being lost to this generation they're not watching a lot of these older films because they're not the quality that they, they for some reason think they're not as good or, but they just also don't know about them or there's just not enough time in their day. <laughs> there's so much stuff they've got to keep watching. Cause it's just a like walking dead. <laughs> there's three walking deads going out at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Pete, I can, on one hand, like that's one of the uh, the real paradigm shifts, and you know w- when that sort of that whole concept of binge came in, and then you know with the with the production value on so many shows now, you're essentially getting a movie each episode. Some you know a lot of these shows, you know, for example, The Walking Dead, one episode is probably worth more than you know a lot of sort of um, you know not mainstream, but your yeah, minor stream, shall we say, film releases. Um, yep. But but you're absolutely right, you know, and, and I'm guilty of it too. I, From a psychological perspective, I've sort of been swept into the, the digital realm as well in the sense of if I do sit down, finally get away from the computer or writing or doing the website or whatever it might be, editing, the button, you, you, you literally, if it doesn't grab you within 10 seconds, you're over it. And not only that, you also... Re- a lot of the times you're you're still influenced by people saying oh you got to watch this series you got to watch this series and so there's there's a sense of obligation sometimes that comes because because there's so much out there so much choice that if somebody if there is one thing that you can cling to and watch that everyone else watched gives you an opportunity to talk but one thing that i've discovered being somebody who still goes to the cinema a lot you know we go to these latest release cinemas the night the day they come out uh, sorry latest release movies there'll be 10 people in the cinema it's absolutely yep. ridiculous and it breaks my heart especially you know when we go see any of the horror ones but we go see you know any good movie that comes out um i think how do, how do they even justify keeping these cinema going and yet the irony is the the 80s horror movies that we're going to see you know whether it's reanimator or shining um or there was killer clowns from outer space we got to see um you know return of the living dead stuff like that the cinema's full you know at, like back in the old days and when i look around there's young people in the audience um and i think what's going on <laughs> you know like how's this and, work uh and i think it's going back to what i was just talking about because f- for a lot of us that's your film that's your childhood that's nostalgia is a massive thing oh absolutely and- i can justify being there but when i see someone who's 19 who wasn't even born when the film came out no but look at their parents <laughs> that 19 year old's dad is a fan and has introduced it like the way my dad showed me wild geese and wild geese has a very special place in my heart and almost nobody's heard of that film these days yeah but Uh, because isn't it weird though but when we look at the if if we do the math you know for example um us loving or going to see a 1981 82 movie so what's that 40 years you know um so when we were kids then you know in 1980 that would be the equivalent of a 1940s movie now there's nothing hip about a 1940s movie when you were 11 years old at school in fact there's no way most of us would have sat through a 1950s movie you know all th- for most of our lives and yet here we are uh something like the thing or evil dead or the terminator stuff like that they are the equivalent of 40 years we're, we're talking 40 years like you said the 40th anniversary of thing that still carries some gravitas it's still cool you're still seeing terminator stuff you're still seeing evil dead stuff you're seeing people kids wearing the t-shirt you know of a film that's 40 years old 
uh, it's it's a, a testament, I think, to to the creativity of, and I guess you know that that lightning in a bottle of of how the art and the medium was um, how we got to experience it back then, and how it's rippled through time.